Hello, health enthusiasts. If you are looking to optimize your body's natural detoxification processes, you're in luck because I have an exclusive free guide just for you. It's called How to Optimize Detoxification, and it's packed with my top eight tips to help you support your body's ability to eliminate toxins effectively. In this guide, you'll discover the key organs involved in detoxification and how to keep them functioning at their best, nutritional strategies to enhance your body's natural detox pathways, lifestyle habits that can make a big difference in your overall toxin load, and much more. To get your hands on this valuable resource, simply head over to www.rootcausology.com slash detox and download your free copy today. That's www.rootcausology dot com slash D-E-T-O-X. Trust me, your body will thank you for taking the time to learn these essential detoxification tips. Now let's dive into today's episode. Welcome to Get to the Root of It. I am Laurel Brennan, the host, and I'm here with Ashley Malik. Did I say it right? Yes. Awesome. Ashley is. Um, I'm very excited to have her here today. And let me just read a little bit about Ashley. Ashley helps corporate moms lose weight with an anti-inflammatory nutrition strategy that is family friendly. After losing 55 pounds with hypothyroidism, Ashley developed a method to kickstart weight loss and healing for women who have tried everything, but nothing works. Combining her education as an MSW, Master's in Social Work, a certified mindset coach, plus 10 years of personal experience, research, and endless doctor's appointments, Ashley's approach guides women to lose weight, gain energy, and live the happy life they deserve. Woo! Yay, yeah. yeah, Ashley. <laughs> a lot of women are going to be excited about what you talk about today. So welcome first. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited for this conversation. Me too. So first, can you share a little bit about your personal journey of with weight loss and how that led you to your unique approach, which is what really attracted me? And I was like, oh, I've got to talk to Ashley. So <laughs> Tell us about it. Exactly. So I was, uh, it was probably when I was in my late 30s. Um, I was working in a corporate job. It was actually a, a tech startup. And so we were working very long hours. Um, my life was just felt chaotic. I was doing a lot of traveling. I was a single mom at the time, uh, raising a very uh, spirited <laughs> young boy at the time. And I just noticed that no matter what I tried to do, I could not lose weight. Like, could I tried everything and I couldn't lose weight and it felt really frustrating. And I was also finding that I was experiencing a lot of like brain fog and exhaustion and it was hard to deal with. And if you're a woman that you have these symptoms, you know, like it impacts every part of your life. But for me, it was really starting to impact my, my career and my position at the, at my job at that time. And so I started by trying to figure out, okay, what, what is going on under the hood? What is the problem here? And so I started seeing doctor after doctor after doctor. And again, ladies, if you've been out there and you're like, okay, I know something's wrong. And I keep going to my doctor, you probably hear what's wrong. Your blood looks okay. Just come back in six months. And I got really tired of hearing just come back in six months because nothing was changing. I was gaining weight. I sort of joked that I would like look at a piece of cake and I would gain weight. And it was so frustrating. And I felt terrible. I did not feel like myself. And so finally, I sort of connected with a woman who I decided, I was like, well, surely I'm in early menopause. That has to be it because I can't figure out anything else. So I connected with a woman who is a functional practitioner and, um, she, we met, she took, I think it was like 16 vials of blood. She asked me hundreds of questions. And at the end of that result, we found out that I did have hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's disease. And I also had severe nutrient deficiencies. So it sort of stood to reason that 
I felt like garbage. And I started learning as much as I could about my, my situation and my condition and really recognized that anti-inflammatory eating was the thing that was going to be most impactful for me. Sure, there were like supplements and medications and that kind of thing, but really the food that I was eating, I was a pretty healthy eater. I had to completely revamp what I ate. And as I sort of went through this journey, I recognized that a lot of women are like me. They often have the tools for weight loss, they have a meal plan or they have a supplement or they have some like nugget of information. They don't know how to put it all together. And so when I was able to put together a system and a strategy for losing weight and healing my gut health, I lost 55 pounds. I had tons of energy. I mean, at three o'clock in the afternoon, you can find me this energetic. And I like, I was never that way before. And so once I discovered like how to put it all together in a way that works, again, at the time I was a single mom, I still had to cook dinner every night. My son was not going to eat, you know, zucchini noodles. So I had to, I had to figure out this system and this strategy. So once I did, I, I recognized I have to bring this to other women because women are spending years feeling terrible and they just, they don't need to, they, they need to just have the right tools for them that works with their family so they can live their life and be really successful in life, in career, and feel really great and lose that weight that they just feel like they can't lose at all. Yeah. Well, good for you for number one, staying curious and continuing to travel down that road even though you might've had to take a couple detours because one person said, um, nothing's wrong with you. Come back in six months. And another person said, nothing's wrong with you. Come back in six months. You're like, but something's wrong. You listened to your body and you found someone who dug a little deeper to look at root causes, which is my whole thing. Um, and you discovered that, yeah, there were definitely issues that you could address. And so how did you start? Like, I mean, eventually you came up with a system that you're now teaching other people. Mm-hmm. So you probably have to have a couple of fumbles along the way. Like what were, what were your <laughs> roadblocks? Like yeah. what happened? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's definitely not a, a straight line. I'm sure people have seen on Instagram, you know, that, that like point from point A to point B is just this really jagged line. And that's what my journey looked like as well. I started with the autoimmune protocol right out of the gate, and that was very difficult. And it, if if people or listeners are not familiar with that, it's really basically stripping down to the essentials of nutrition and healing your gut health and your, your microbiome and everything so that you can start to reintroduce foods and reintroduce different types of exercise. Like I I completely stopped exercising because even working out was giving me inflammation and swelling and all this kind of thing. So I I definitely failed because I was, I loved to bake when, before all of this happened. And so when I figured out like, okay, I, I have to use different flours and I have to use different ingredients well, I started making all the brownies, all the bread, and I was still using cassava flour and tiger nut flour and different things, but it wasn't very helpful to me. And so I really had to keep going and stay the course in order to learn what did my body actually need. And um, I think along the way, part of the journey of of healing and understanding what my body needed was being able to just get really deeply honest with myself that this was not a deprivation diet. I was not being punished for not, you know, eating well or taking good care of myself or any of those things. I really had to just sit in that belief that my body is asking for something different. And how do I honor what my body is asking for? Because it's really easy as we get around our family or we go to a holiday or something and people are like, what? You're not eating gluten? Just eat gluten. Just have that drink. It's no problem. And it was really hard for me. And I think is hard for lots and lots of women and men that are trying to change. We don't, we don't want to feel left out. We don't want to feel deprived. And so that's definitely 
been a huge part of the journey um, in, in being able to heal and be successful and keep my healing going. Yeah. Awesome. I'm, I can definitely relate. And I'm sure that there's many, many people out there um, not to pick on men at all, but it, it often seems as if women tend to be more focused on health. That's a broad generalization. I know. So, um, you know, not always do the other people that live in your home want to do exactly what you're doing. They might not, they might support you and say, yeah, good for you for investigating your health and changing up your diet, but I'm still going to eat grilled cheese and potato chips. So how, <laughs> how do you negotiate that? <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? And that, that was really me. You know, it's, I, like I said, I had my son at the time and he was growing and he was tall and he was strong and he was playing lacrosse multiple times a week. And I had to figure out, okay, if I need an anti-inflammatory meal, which is probably looking like, let's say cauliflower rice and chicken and some sort of you know, healthy based sauce, my son wasn't going to eat that. And so I think what I figured out is that there's a way to pick similar components. And this is the method that I teach is called component cooking, where you can have a veggie and you can have a protein. And around that, you can create one meal that works for you who needs to eat anti inflammatory, but then a similar meal for your family who wants to eat very conventional foods. So if we take burgers, for example, I love to grill. My family loves burgers. And so I can make myself a hamburger. I'm using meat that feels good to me, which is grass fed meat. And everybody can eat that. Nobody knows the difference one way or another. And then I'll make a veggie on the side. So maybe roasted broccoli that works. For me, then I'm probably putting my burger on a bed of lettuce. I probably have some paleo ketchup that goes on there. So it's just low sugar. Um, bitchin' sauce is one of my favorite things. I probably use it three times a day. So that feels good to me. My family can also have the burger. They can also have the broccoli. They're just adding a bun. And maybe I'm putting some cheese on their burger. So if we can get creative about the meals that our family likes, that's often a place that I start is how do you take your family's favorite meal and make it anti-inflammatory so that as women, as moms, we are cooking one meal. We're not spending a lot of extra time in the kitchen. We're not feeling resentful that we have to cook two meals because then that feels bad. And what happens is as the person eating anti-inflammatory, we cave we say, forget it. I, I don't want to have to cook two meals. It's too hard. It's too much work. I'm just going to make one meal and I'm just going to suffer the consequences. And we don't have to, we don't have to, it takes a little extra work, but we don't have to do it that way. Right. Can you talk a little bit about what anti-inflammatory means for someone who might not know, well, what do I eat if I'm trying to reduce inflammation in my body? Uh, yep. I'm sorry. Can you, I broke up a little bit. Can you repeat the question, Laurel? Sorry. What is anti-inflammatory? What, what does that look like? Yeah. So anti-inflammatory, what happens in our bodies, and it doesn't just have to be that you have a thyroid issue. This happens as we age, um, as we slow down in life, our bodies have systemic inflammation and by eating foods that combat the inflammation and also eating foods that support not more inflammation, not having extra inflammation, we can feel a lot better. So anti-inflammatory traditionally looks a very similar to like a Mediterranean diet where we're cutting out gluten. Um, I do advocate cutting out dairy as much as possible, uh, refined sugar, should definitely come out. Sugar is one of the most inflammatory things for our bodies. Um, I do recommend trying to cut out alcohol as much as possible. And it's hard because I say all of these things. And if this is new to you, you're thinking, well, that sounds terrible. <laughs> but I assure you, I still eat cookies. I eat chocolate. 
I, I don't drink. I choose not to drink, but that's my personal choice. Um, but I still love the food that I eat. And so it's just, it's learning how to find this balance. And again, not feeling deprived or resentful that your family or your friends get to eat the things that you used to eat. Because when you change to anti-inflammatory diet, you recognize, oh, I feel so much better. I get to participate in life at a different level in a different way because I feel good. And so you can still eat cookies and chocolate. We just do it a little bit differently. Right. Yes. I had a similar journey after a, a diagnosis, a multiple sclerosis diagnosis. I went off of gluten and dairy rather as soon as I learned that that could be beneficial in reducing inflammation, but I didn't get the message about cutting out sugar. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I made gluten-free brownies on a regular. Um, I was making every gluten-free dessert you could think of. And it wasn't until many years later that I learned, oh, I really, really should cut out the sugar and increase the vegetables. So yeah. <laughs> I mean, we also want to teach our kids how to eat healthy. So you're also teach, you're educating them at the same time, even if they're not eating exactly what you're eating, they're yeah. learning that yeah. this is an anti-inflammatory diet and you're still putting in lots of veggies, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's it's very easy to drop in veggies. Um, I sort of joke that my daughter is like the sauce queen. If I have a veggie, as long as I have a sauce or a dip or something for it to go in, she'll eat it. She eats broccoli and cauliflower every night. I don't know how we got this kid, but you know she is okay with that. But we also talk a lot about, you know, she'll say, oh, "Mom, can I have a Hershey Kiss for dessert?" And we'll talk about, okay, well, what did you have for snack at school today? Oh, you had Lucky Charms for snack at school? Let's have fruit instead for dessert. And she's like, okay. And so teaching our kids to sort of make choices and think holistically. I'm not an advocate, especially with younger kids of like cutting out all the things. It's about the education, like you said, teaching our kids, our young ones, how to just make some smart choices that will lead them to healthier choices, not because we're deprived, but because we just want to feel really good. Yeah. I like that you're touching on, you know, this is not, not depriving myself. I'm still really enjoying the food that I'm eating. So you're really getting into the mindset piece because nobody is going to stick with a a new way of eating that tastes bad, (laughs) that feels like a fight every time they're, they're, cooking with their family. So you're really talking a lot about mindset. I mean, mindset is a big piece of what you, what you teach. Can you tell us more about that mindset connection? Absolutely. So I, you know, like I mentioned, when I was going through my own personal journey, I realized that I somehow I had to, my brain and my heart and my stomach all had to agree And that was really hard to grapple with that because at the time, all around me, my friends were drinking, we were going out every weekend, you know, having parties and barbecues and all sorts of things. And mindset is, I like to say that if you, if all it took to lose weight or to heal your gut health or your health overall, if all it took was another meal plan or another supplement, you would be great by now. Everybody would feel amazing. They would be at their dream weight. The problem is that we start to attach stories and meaning to the foods that we eat or how we feel when we are around those foods. So I think the holidays are always a really great example. When we have holidays in my family growing up, it was baking sugar cookies with homemade frosting. And they were these thick slabs of sugar cookies. They were amazing. They would sort, they were soft. Oh, they were so good. And when I went gluten and dairy and sugar free, that cookie was not an option for me anymore. And what, what I think we find in those holiday situations is sort of we, our brain says, oh, I can't eat any of this. That feels really bad. And either I'm embarrassed that I've chosen to like eat a different way. And I don't know how to explain that to people. Or I feel frustrated and mad and resentful. And so oftentimes our brain 
gives us this story and our brain says, it's okay. We're just going to do it this one. It's just this one holiday. It'll be totally fine. What happens is then the next Saturday, there's like a follow-up party or there's a cocktail party and brain again offers up the same story and says, no problem. It's okay. You can just have the drinks tonight. Don't worry about it. We'll be fine. And what, if we dig a little bit deeper into that, what we find is that it's not that we're not smart and we don't know that by eating two or three sugar cookies, we know that that's going to have an impact. But as we dig deep, we see, oh, if I don't eat the cookies, I'm sort of like snubbing my nose at my family's tradition. I don't fit in when everyone else is eating those cookies. I feel like an outsider. I feel like I'm being judged. People are asking me like, what are you doing? And why are you, why are you bothering with that? I feel bad. Very often it boils down to shame. This shame of feeling like, oh, I don't belong here. I don't, but I don't know where I belong. I don't have gluten-free friends, but my family's not gluten and sugar-free and I don't belong. Those are actually the stories that if we can start to uncover deeply how we're feeling about not just saying no to the cookie, but actually feeling like I don't belong in my family or I don't know how to create a new tradition because the cookie tradition has been part of my family for 50 or more years. And so that is the story and the narrative that leads us to finally cave and just say, oh, fine, I'll have the cookie. And so as we look to lose weight, heal our gut health, really get to the root cause of what's going on in our body, we have to do that with our brain. We have to do that with our mindset and our nervous system. Our brain is really responsible for three things, to avoid pain, to seek pleasure, and to conserve energy. And so when we look at saying no to the cookie, that feels painful. It feels sad. We miss the cookie. We miss the way it tastes. And so brain says, no, our primal brain is trying to like protect us. No, that's unsafe. And so we end up having the cookie. You do that time and time and time again, you're never going to get better. You're not going to lose the weight that you're trying to lose. And so that's why I say it's really, you can have all the meal plans in the world. You can have all of the discipline in the world and eating the right things. If you can't get your heart and your brain and your stomach all in alignment to what your mindset needs to be for healing and good health, it's going to be very difficult to get there. So a big piece of what you teach on and educate people about is not just this component eating that allows you and your family to eat together, but mindset that allows you to be successful this week and next week and next month and next year with this new lifestyle. Yes. And I just yes. want to say you're channeling one of my, um, my favorite social workers with the shame story with Brené Brown, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure you're a fan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Most yeah. things boil down the shame, unfortunately. <laughs> Very interesting though. And um, can you, can you share a little bit about the alcohol trigger? Because I think that's a trigger for a lot of people. You can sort of go to a restaurant and get away with, you know, you go to a Mexican restaurant, you go to almost any um, ethnic restaurant, you can get gluten and dairy free pretty easily on the menu. Yep. But then when all your friends are drinking cocktails, mm -hmm. you start to feel left out. I know I've heard this from a lot of people. So what do you do with the, the alcohol thing? Yeah, it is very difficult because with alcohol, I, I think many cultures, it is the way that we socially connect and Everything, like even if you look around at like status, you know, what type of wine you're drinking or what type of bourbon you're enjoying or whiskey, like there, there is a level of um, belonging in what you drink, how you drink it, when you drink it. And, you know, I just, I had two clients just this week. One client was struggling because she had been out last Saturday with all of her girlfriends and it was like drinking night. That's what, that's what they were going to do. And another client of mine, she said, 
uh, we were talking specifically about the alcohol piece and why she might not be reaching her goals. And she said, well, I have like 20 girlfriends and we go out every Saturday and do wine tasting. I'm not about to give that up. And so with both of those women, we have to dig in and say, what is driving the thought that we have and the feeling of drinking? So it really truly is if I go out on a Saturday night and all of my friends are drinking, and this is typically what we do. And, and there's no, I have no judgment towards it because this is part of our culture. We go out, we have happy hour, couple of drinks, you wake up the next day, you try and like feel a little bit better. And so for this one particular client of mine, if she went out and didn't have drinks, her friends would question like, why aren't you drinking? What's going on? Are you okay? Or, you know, she would feel like she didn't belong. And so in her brain, her thought process is sort of going something like this, that oh, it's Saturday night. And I know that I just actually weighed myself yesterday and I've lost 11 pounds. So I know I've been doing really well on my weight loss journey, but it's Saturday night and I'm going to go out and I'm really excited about having a couple of cocktails I don't know what to do, but my feeling is like anxiety. I have this feeling of anxiousness or have this feeling of uncertainty. Our brain, again, in trying to keep us safe by conserving energy and finding pleasure and avoiding pain, uncertainty is very painful. We don't know what's going to happen. And so as a result, she went out, she had a couple of drinks. And then four days later, when we met, she said, Ashley, I feel terrible. I, my, I'm puffy. I'm bloated. feel bad. And really the same thing happened there. She didn't want to feel left out. She didn't want to be the not fun friend. She didn't want to have to say or, you know, disclaimer, like, oh, I'll just be the designated driver. And that's why, you know, I'm not drinking tonight, but she didn't know what to do. And so this is where I work with clients to help them understand. We can't just say, I'll be fine. I'll do better next time. Our brain doesn't believe that. We have to slowly build evidence to say, okay, next time I'm actually going to talk to one of my closer friends before the event, before we go out on Saturday night and say, you know, I'm working really hard to change up my health and my wellness. I am going to not drink on Saturday night. Can you help support me with that? Because I'm struggling to hold my own boundaries. And then all of a sudden you have an ally in your journey. And eventually, once you do that two times, 10 times, a hundred times, your ally is yourself because then you've learned to trust yourself. You've learned to trust the journey that you're on. And you know, I don't need the drinks because I feel so much better if I don't drink and I can hit my weight loss or my health goals and continue on my journey. So it doesn't happen overnight. And I think that's As humans, we want it to just happen instantly, and it doesn't. It takes time, but the more times that you do it, the more consistent you are, the easier it is for you to set your boundaries and to be able to hold your own ground and to trust yourself. Right. And what about having the importance of having peers that are supporting your Mm -hmm. journey? I mean... That, that can be challenging. I think, um, I try to create that in my own little world and with clients and just try to create a group that they can come to where they know they can, when we all get together, we're not going to drink. We are going to have healthy food. We are going to, you know, walk instead of sit. Um, there's going to be some positive conversation, but that might not be your normal peer group. Like, right. how do you, I mean, maybe this isn't your, <laughs> what you focus on, but I know that this is a, 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 a roadblock for some people. Mm-hmm. Like, what mm-hmm. if, what if you're the only person telling them that this is a, a healthy way to live? What if, what if yep. their family member and their friends are all saying, come on, that's ridiculous. You can drink, you can have gluten. That's a bunch of hogwash. Yeah. I mean, suggestions there. Yeah, I think finding a community is the most essential 
piece to being successful on your journey. And I would say more clients than not do not have supportive family. It all, it, it all starts at home. You know, if you have, especially if you have teenagers at home, you know, teenagers are not always kind. <laughs> so, you know, if you're trying to serve certain things for dinner or they see that you're eating something drastically different, um, they're, they're not always supportive. And so finding, finding the right group of people to be around is highly, highly important, whether it's a chat group or an in-person group, or even just following your Instagram page and my Instagram page, like being in community with other people who are living this journey every day is imperative because eventually you will get to the place where you actually aren't as concerned about what your family thinks or not. But in the meantime, that's very difficult because again, we haven't learned to trust ourselves yet on this journey. We're still learning how to do that. And, um, you know, I have one client who her, her family does an annual hunting trip. And for her, it was, it was back to that like tradition that I was talking about earlier. She wanted to bring different things on the hunting trip because the hunting trip included Doritos and sodas and different things that she knew did not make her feel good. And it all goes back to mindset and understanding that it's, we have to learn how to trust what journey we're on. But until you do that, you have to find people where you can borrow their belief. You can borrow their support. Um, without a group, it's really, really hard to do, especially when it's your friends or your family right inside of your house that aren't supportive of you every day. And eventually they will be because they will see the more that you change your nutrition, the more that you change your habits, the better mom you are, the better wife or spouse or partner you are, uh, the better, you know, daughter you can be like it, it changes your life. But again, it just takes time and you need, you need your friends to carry you on that journey for a while. Right. I like that you mentioned that your community can be virtual, just having any community whether they're physical or virtual, can be amazingly supportive and and critical, especially in early days. Yeah. And um, yeah, so thank you for sharing that. And 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 that you have to continue to build evidence. Like once you have done this ten times, twenty times, a hundred times, it makes it much easier to. I don't know. I don't know if I want to say stand your ground, but it just it becomes like not a big deal to say, Oh, I, you know, I don't, I don't want that pizza. And you actually don't want that pizza because you know that you feel better when you don't have it. Yeah. yeah. That, was, that was the thing too, that it like there, I I've been doing this for over 10 years and I still feel tempted by the Christmas cookies. I still get tempted sometimes with, gosh, I really would like a nice smooth glass of tequila. But I just know because I've I've worked on myself enough to know that I won't feel great. But the temptation doesn't go away. And sometimes we fall back into those old habits. So know that it's not like a one and done. You're like, yep, I'm good. <laughs> like it just, it's constant, never-ending improvement in being able to trust ourselves. And yeah, it's I think instead of stand your ground, it's really just trust yourself what journey you're on and how you want to feel at the end of the day. Yeah, I like that. Thanks for correcting me. Trust, stand your ground. What didn't feel right, but I needed other words. Yeah, trust, trust yourself. Begin to build up the trust and the and the evidence. So, big components of what you teach are the component cooking and the mindset. And I know you're not a doctor, but if you don't mind, would you be willing to share kind of how? this anti-inflammatory lifestyle has impacted gut health and your hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's. For sure. For sure. So, um, yeah, where do I even start with that? It's, it, it has completely changed my health from the inside out. And I, for a very long time, I have struggled with all of the things. I have had SIBO and candida overgrowth, 
once at the same time. I, you know, with the Hashimoto's and I had a high A1C, like all the things in my body were not working well for a while. And as I've slowly, you know, transitioned into that anti-inflammatory diet, my um, hypothyroidism is totally managed. My Hashimoto's is completely in remission. All of my, my blood sugar, my cholesterol, everything is within normal range. I had an appointment with my functional practitioner a couple months ago. And when she looked at my lab, she said, Ashley, whatever you are doing, keep doing it because it's working. Um, I, you know, I have switched the kind of workouts that I do. So I think that's another impactful piece. A lot of times we think, oh, I'm just going to like do more cardio or run more, do work out harder. I've changed to non-impact strength training and I have actually built muscle mass, but without increasing any inflammation in my body. So it's really, it, and I do like, I'm very transparent as well. I am on thyroid medication. I do take a number of supplements, um, every day, but to watch from where I was that I had severe nutrient deficiencies and, and we're talking like hair falling out, the driest skin, nails breaking everywhere, like any ailment you can think of, I had it and I struggled with it. And today I just feel amazing. So it takes time. We have this belief again in wanting things so quickly. Um, you know, I, <laughs> the gal that I was telling you about that like to do like wine tasting every weekend, she's like, well, I did a dry 30 and I didn't really notice any difference. I tell my clients, don't start expecting to see anything change until about six months in. Our bodies are, it's like when you get a bad grade in school, like you start with an A and you have one failed test and you have an F. It takes you half the semester to get back to that A. We do not get our health back. Maybe we did when we were 19 or 20, but I'm going to be 49 this year. And no, we... <laughs> takes time. So we just have to keep going. And again, that's where that community is so important and entrusting ourselves. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. It just takes time. Yeah. So excited for you that you had such a, a turnaround, uh, with overall health and Thank you. hypothyroidism. Um, you know, it, it's one of the most common autoimmune diseases, like, and it's often as you found out, not initially diagnosed, if they're just looking at TSH, um, if you if you look at the whole panel, you might identify something that's coming on early. Uh, we, we won't get into that too much, but I just wanted to put that out there in case anybody hears, well, my doctor checked and I don't, I, my TSH is normal. There might be more to it than just the TSH. Uh, and so I'm so excited for you that that you feel so good. And that's, what's really motivating, you know, when, yeah. when you start to see such a see yeah. and feel such a positive changes. Yeah. I, I have to share that yeah. one, one of your recent posts about summer is coming and you start to like panic about your leg showing. I'm like, Oh my God, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> Every year. Yeah. So I love that you're like, so, so honest with, so I, I People need to follow you on Instagram. So if you, will you just tell us your Instagram? Cause I just, I love your stuff. Yeah, I'm at the <laughs> Ashley Malik, M-A-L-I-K. And yeah, it's, I, you know, I was talking to my husband just last night and I'm like, I sometimes forget that like, I do this for a living because I really do. I try and help women to understand where they're at, but I am terrified about short season and I may have lost weight, but I still have, I still have body issues. I still have thoughts about the foods that I eat or the barbecues that I go to. Like I am human. And I think the more that we can talk about that and be transparent, we recognize that all of life is a journey. Like it's just, it's, you just don't get to lose the weight and say, Oh, I'm done. Check that off my list. You know, it's so I, 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 my goal is to be as transparent as possible because I'm just like everyone else. I don't want to wear a bathing suit quite yet. <laughs> I just love that you so honestly shared that because sometimes people will look at 
social media and assume that because somebody is teaching this body of of information that they have it all figured out and they are perfect and they are on this pedestal to shoot for. It's like, well, <laughs> we are no. all still always figuring it out. <laughs> yeah. And if you look at my laundry room, you will also know that I am still trying to figure it all out. <laughs> it's a disaster in there. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, is there anything else that you want to make sure that we share. I know that I want people to know that as part of your plan, you teach people how to not cook as much because that was another thing that drew um, me to you when you said, you know, seven days of anti-inflammatory meals, cook three nights. twice, three times, three mm -hmm. times, cook three times. Like, yes, because it's, um, exhausting sometimes to think about, <clears throat> excuse me, what am I going to cook tonight? Uh, I guess it's going to be peanut butter and jelly because I don't have it in me. So. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think one of the biggest things well, that I hear from women is uh, it, like take out Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A in my area is like the thing because everybody thinks, oh, I'm going to get some healthy takeout. Um, yes. I have a, a free plan and I, I think we can link to it, but um, where again, when I was a single mom, I'm working over 60 hours a week. I was commuting two hours a day and I did not have time to come home and cook lavish meals, nor was that enjoyable to me. I like to cook, but I would rather not spend all of my day doing that. So I came up with a, a plan that allows you to cook three nights and then the other four nights of the week were repackaging. And I don't like to call it leftovers because it's not. Like to me, it's if you're having a hamburger one night, leftovers is a burger the next night. The way my plans work is that you have hamburgers one night and four nights later, you're actually chopping up that hamburger. You're putting it into um, pizza sauce or like marinara sauce. And then we're pouring it over a baked potato and all of a sudden we have like a very different type of meal, even though we've only cooked one time. Um, and so I, I think that that's important. It's a lot of people that I meet up with, they don't like to cook. And they, in their brain, that's the story of, I can't lose weight because I don't like to cook and I don't know where the healthiest fast food is or the healthiest takeout. We have to just be okay with Years ago, I read this cookbook and it was all about 30 minute meals. And in the beginning, the author said, look, if you want to have dinner on the table in 30 minutes, you're going to work your butt off for 30 minutes and then you're going to be done. And I'm like, that's such a brilliant way to think about it. I'm going to work hard for 30 minutes, three nights a week. And the rest of my week is smooth sailing. And these plans are also built like we talked about so that there's an anti-inflammatory way of making that meal. And then there's the conventional way of making the meal. And I really encourage people, get your family involved, get your partner, get your kids involved in seeing what goes into making a meal. And when you've got those nights that you're not doing extra cooking, get them in there to do a little chopping or help have them help you assemble your meals. It should be one of the thoughts and realizations that I had on my journey is, very often we like to, and this is all across all cultures, we like to think of food as this thing that like makes us feel good. And when I started changing my narrative to my food is the thing that fuels me, I, I still want to eat good food, but not every meal needs to taste so amazing. And I don't need to cook something totally different every single night of the month. I need to be strategic. I need a protein and a veggie, a healthy carbohydrate, and I need to move on with my life. I would rather spend time hanging out for movie night or going to the lacrosse field to watch my son or anything but just like living around food. And it's hard because, again, food brings us together as cultures, as families, as people. But if you can look at it as your nourishment and your fuel, it still tastes good. Again, I eat cookies, I eat chocolate every day, but. I just want to eat my food and then get moving because the rest of my life is far more exciting than what my meals are. <laughs> and I want to live that part. So thank you for creating a plan. And 
it's really nice of you to offer it for free. Yeah. <laughs> that allows people to um, have a free diet and cook only three times a week and have component cooking in case there's other people in their household who are not at this moment interested in eating a hundred percent inflammatory diet. So like that is amazing. So we'll definitely link the that resource in the show notes because it's great. It's it's also beautiful. So I downloaded it and I love it. And um before we wrap up, I is there anything else that I missed? What do you want to say that we haven't said yet? Um I think probably what I wish I would have known 10 years ago is that it's okay. It's okay to get going. It's okay to make mistakes along the way. It's so important to give ourselves some grace because we we're trying to learn things that we don't know. Like I didn't even know some of the questions to ask. I didn't even know what information I was missing in my healing journey. And it's okay. It doesn't, you know, it, it took me maybe six years to go gluten free or to go dairy free altogether and six years. And I knew just take the time to learn, implement small things, be consistent more than perfect. Because if you try and, you know, I think that's what happens. Oftentimes people do like whole 30 or autoimmune paleo and they try and go all in. It's too overwhelming. Again, our brains are trying to protect us from something that doesn't feel safe. And that kind of drastic change in your nutrition and lifestyle it feels uncomfortable and scary. And so that's when our brains are like, well, I did whole 30. I'm done. I'm walking away from that. Do little things more consistently over time. And you're going to find that you heal it, Again, it doesn't happen overnight, but just remember that it's okay. If you're doing what you can today, it's okay. If you messed up or you made a choice that didn't make you feel good, it's okay. It's okay. You will get there if you're consistent over time. Yeah. I think one of the books back there is Atomic Habits, like just 1%, 1% better each day. And and if you have a slip back, it's okay. You have like some reserves, you know, you went. Yeah. 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 And, and in my yoga classes that I teach, I also, often we give ourselves a hug and sometimes we just need that. <laughs> give yourself a little hug. It's okay. Okay. Yep. It's okay. Yeah. But thank you for, thank you for sharing that. Oh, it's been wonderful chatting with you today, Ashley. Thank you for sharing your your joy and your knowledge and your story and your love. It's it's very evident that you you used your journey to heal yourself and now you want to share that that journey, that gift, that joy with others. So thank you for for spreading the good. Thank you. It's been so fun chatting and I just we could keep doing this for a long time, I'm sure. <laughs>